Well, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Can you give God a shout of praise this morning if you're still breathing, if he's been good to you? Oh, don't look at me. You're not clapping for me. You're clapping for him. Come on. Can you give God a shout of praise? Okay, y'all want to play. That's a cute golf clap. If God has done anything for you, I know you're trying to figure out how I'm about to preach and what I'm about to do, but this ain't about me. This is about the creator of the universe, the king of kings and the Lord and lords, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Every hand lifted right now. Every hand lifted in this room if you're comfortable. Holy Spirit, right now we need you. We didn't come here to play games. We didn't come here to hear from a person. We didn't come here to cover up our pain with a shout. We came to be real today. So, God, I thank you for your spirit. The same spirit, Lord Jesus, that in your word it says that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives on the inside of us. I thank you that your peace is resting in this room. I speak right now to the heavy heart and the burdened soul. I thank you for the comforter, Lord Jesus. Your word says that it's good that I go, for I shall send the advocate, the comforter, the standby, the one who will come alongside. Holy Spirit, rest in this room. Wind of God, blow through this place again. Wake up dead dreams, Lord God. Revive dead hearts, Lord Jesus. Do whatever you want to do, and you get all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said? Oh, come on. Everybody said? Why don't you give him one more shout of praise? Well, you can take your seats this morning. You can take your seat. I want to welcome everybody watching online. Hello, hello. I am honored to be here today. Very grateful, very humbled, and um, I'm here uh, with a specific assignment. I know why I'm here and what I'm here to do, and uh, we're going to waste no time, but before we get into the Word of God this morning, I want to take a time to uh, thank a couple of people. First off, I want to honor uh, your amazing pastors, Pastor John and Pastor Aventer, who are here. I love you so much. Can you give it up for your pastors if you love them? Very grateful for you. Love you so much. You are so full of strength and grace and kindness and love. And uh, man, you guys have a gift. And, um, you know, I, I consider it a, a very big honor to be on this stage in this moment um, because uh, there are a lot of different people who could be here, maybe should be here. Um, but I'm confident that God placed me here for this moment. Uh, before we jump into the word, I got to let you know uh, the priorities here. Um, I would be disingenuous if I acted like uh, preaching and pastoring was the first most important thing to me because it's not. Uh, I am married to a beautiful woman named Abby Rose Metcalf, the love of my life. We've been together since 2014. We have four amazing little chickens. I have, uh, they're wild. They're probably running rampant somewhere right now. But um, Arlo Phoenix, my oldest son, Luna Rose, the lion. She is, uh, all my kids, there's my beautiful kids right there. That's my family. You can't tell in the black and white picture, but I have two white kids and two mixed kids in there. They split us down the middle. Uh, so Arlo, that's our boy in the middle. To the uh, In my right hand uh, is Luna Rose with the little piggy tails. That's my girl. Then Jade October, our little bumblebee is right there. And then the newest addition is Baby Blue Sunday. Um, so Baby Blue, she's our, our youngest. So we had four kids in four years. So um, we, we don't waste no time. You hear what I'm saying? To God be the glory. Yeah, we didn't have no games to play, and um, but to God be the glo glory, the uh, controller has been unplugged, if you know what I'm saying. So we're, we're, <laughs> we are just having fun from this point on. So, <laughs> look, some of y'all don't know if you can laugh. You're like, oh, calm down, calm down. But, um, <laughs> you know, you, some of y'all, you had a little brother, and he'd be like, can I play? He'd be like, yeah, and you hand him the controller that don't, it ain't going at all, and he just in there going like that. So, um. But listen, I am, I, I said it, but I'm honored to be here today, and, and I say that very um, humbly and very present because I think it is a gift um, to be present of where you are and understand what God is trying to do. I think there are a lot of moments in our life that we try to rush to the next thing, that we try to um, think about what happens when I get there. The only problem with there is, is you never get there. I don't know if nobody's told you yet, but you know there doesn't exist. Okay, let's say I wanted to go there. 
I'm here and I want to go there. When I get there, it's not there anymore. It's here. And somehow you're still afraid. When I get more money and when I get married and when I get that house and, and when this goes away, all you waiting on is somewhere that does not exist. But if you could be grateful for here, because the Bible says tomorrow has enough worries for itself. Y'all thought this little mixed kid wasn't about to preach. Okay, I'm going to go ahead then. Is that all right? Tomorrow has enough worries for itself. But the fact that I'm standing here, the fact that I got breath in my lungs, I'm grateful for here. I'm not worried about what happens there. I'm not worried about how much money I'm not going to have there. I'm not worried about who's going to be with me, what I got here. All I know is I got somebody with me here. Somebody say, I'm here. That's your testimony right there. Some of y'all shouldn't be here. The fact that you're here is a miracle. The fact that you got your right mind is a miracle. The fact that that woman stayed with you after how crazy you treated her. The fact that you're here is a miracle. The fact your kids are still got their right mind. The fact that there's still money in the bank account. The fact that you got a roof over your head. Somebody say, I'm still here. Yeah, I came to ignite something on the inside of you. You ain't going to get to stay asleep walking out of here. You're not going to get to stay the same standard on the inside of here. There is something on the inside of me. It's not something. It's the Spirit of God has anointed me to proclaim good news that the captives would be set free. Sit down, because I'm about to start running. My goodness, my goodness. Let me take a... <sighs> all right, all right. We're going to read some Bible real quick, okay? We got, I got two Bibles up here with me, honestly, because I got my normal Bible. I grew up in church. I'm a, I'm a pastor's kid, so uh, I come by this honestly. I grew up sitting on the front row, already knowing Dad was about to make up some story about me. So I, I, <laughs> I've been in a lot of these services, and... Um, I am a Bible kid. Like, I, I love the Word of God. And so we're going to read some scripture today, and the Holy Spirit's going to guide us. I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read out of Romans. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 is where we're going to be. <clears throat> and I have, uh, I'm going to read it in, in two different translations because they, they both articulate something so important and so clearly that I want to make sure lands in your heart and soul today. Um, I'm going to read Romans 10, 9. I'll first read it out of the, um, I'll first read it out of the New King James Version, and then we're going to read it out of a different, it says this, Romans 10, 9, New King James, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. I want to go uh, to the message translation. A, a theologian named Eugene Peterson transliterated it this way. It says this, the word of faith, it's the word of faith that welcomes God to the good work. And he sets things right. This is the core of our preaching. Say welcoming to the word of God. Simply say, Jesus is my master. Embracing body and soul. God, God's work of doing this in us is raising Jesus from the dead. That's it. You're not doing anything. That checks some of us right there because you think you saved you. You think God saves you because you follow all these rules. You think your church attendance gets you into heaven. You think your Bible study is what gets you into heaven. You think those things are great and we need all of those things. But let the word of God be clear. You didn't save you. You're not doing anything. You're simply calling out to God and then trusting him to do it. That's salvation. With your whole being, you embrace God setting things right, and then you say it right out loud. God has set everything right between him and me. If you would, I'm going to take a moment. You can grab your seat. I'm going to pray just one more time. Holy Spirit, say whatever you want to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, a little context here for the book of Romans. This is uh, Paul's writings. And Paul is writing to the church at Rome. And the church at Rome is a little, uh, uh, it's, it's a mixed bag of people. It's kind of how your Thanksgiving table is going to be in a couple weeks. You know what I'm saying? You, you, got, you got a little bit of everybody there. You got some, your crazy cousin that we ain't going to really talk about. We got granny who's going to say something sideways and be like, granny, you can't say that. So I say whatever I want to say. I'm 98. So we, we got a lot of different <laughs> People in the Roman church, you have the Jews who have this idea that they have been saved by what they do. 
They've been raised by the law. They've been raised that your good deeds is what gets you in right standing. And now Paul is trying to tell them, hey, just to be clear, it don't work like that no more. Some of us, we have old ideas, old concepts. You've been sitting on a pew so long that you forgot that it is not your doing that gets you right with Jesus. And Paul comes to the church and he says, hey, I want to clarify some things and I want to emphasize some things. I want to make sure you understand how you were saved. Because the Jews think it's by following all of these rules and then there's some Gentiles. They the fresh people, the wild ones. Come on, some of the people that you look a little sideways at when they come into church. That's the people that are in there. And he's saying, listen, they have simply received grace and that's it. That's it. There's no, but what about if you did this many bad? No, 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 no. It's, that's it, grace. But what about if you, you what about so-and-so? Well, what, he said, no, 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 no. Let me emphasize and clarify how you come to this relationship with Jesus. Yes, Romans 10, 9, I told you I grew up in church. I heard this so many times. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. I love it in the message translation because it's so, it's so offensive. He says, you're not doing anything. <laughs> I love it. In John 15, 16, Jesus says these words. He says, I, you didn't choose me, remember? I chose you. And this is what I came to do today. I came to set some things straight on where we fall in the list of who did what. Because some of us, we have the arrogance and the audacity to think that it was you who saved you. It was you who got yourself on the list to go to heaven. It was you who got yourself that job. It was you who brought that family together. It was you who made sure your kids did the right thing. You really think with all your stuff, it was you? Let me not talk about you. Let me say, I know for me, it wasn't me that put me up here. It wasn't me who who aligned my life and set it out straight. It wasn't me who made a plan that I couldn't mess up and work through my mistakes and still brought me to this place. It was that you did not choose me, remember? And some of us, you have forgotten your greatest tool of worship, your ability to remember. We say things like forgive and forget. That works great when you're trying to work through something, but it's not so great for your worship. Because some of y'all forgot who you actually were before you were sitting up here in this church. You forgot how you actually used to act. You forgot where God found you. And as long as you pretend like that didn't happen, you negate a whole part of your testimony that God wants to get glory for. And we got people walking in church talking about, I don't know if I fit in here because I'm really messed up. Baby, don't get it twisted. Everybody on these pews is messed up. Don't let the hat fuel you. Don't let anything fool you. We all got issues. We all got stuff we're going through. And for so long, the greatest tool of the enemy in the church has been you covering up your closed wrist bound with a shout. You don't fool me by your shout because you can shout with your hands cuffed. I told you, I I know y'all trying to figure out who I, who is this boy and what he talking to? Baby, I am here trying to help you. Because so many of us have gotten in the routine of church, the routine. Here's how the scripture says it in 2 Timothy 3, 5. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. You know what denying the power thereof means? It means you deny the grace of God. It means you deny the fact that you didn't get yourself here. It means you deny the fact that you're not the one telling your heart to beat right now. Having a form of godliness, having all the right rules, having all the right devotionals, knowing all the words to the songs, making sure you gave your 10% and you checked it off, and making sure you did all the right things. And I am not here to speak against spiritual disciplines that grow your spirit. What I am here to speak against is the spirit that thinks those disciplines make you better than other people. We... We're trying to make a community, trying to build a church, trying to be a people who are welcoming and inviting, but people can't get past our list we made up to get to Jesus. They got so many, well, make sure you got to do this and make sure you stop doing that, stop drinking this and stop smoking that and don't sleep with nobody and don't say this and don't do that. Stuff that half of us doing anyways. 
sitting here acting like we ain't. But here's the beautiful thing. Grace covers all of that. Grace doesn't discriminate on your race. Grace doesn't care how old you are. Grace doesn't care how young you are. Grace don't care how much money you got in the bank. Grace comes after everybody. It's relentless. It's reckless. It'll find you in your darkest moment. And and Paul is saying in Romans 10, he's saying, I want to make sure the order is right. I want to emphasize and clarify some things. I want to make sure you understand the order of this thing. Because I grew up in church, and in church, uh, there's this idea that you can get into, if you're not careful, that God needs you. You start feeling like, God, God needs me. I can't, if I don't step up, who's going to do it? If I don't do my thing, who's going to do it? And I understand the sentiment, and I understand the idea, but I really, really, really want to clarify this. I love you. I love Let me just say I love you before I say this. I see you looking at me sideways. Somebody over here been looking at me sideways the whole time. It's all right. I love you. God does not need, let me not say you, me. Go with me. If he needed me, he's dependent on me. And if he's dependent on me, Is a person or a being or an entity dependent on me with all my mistakes, with all my mess ups, with all my fears and failures? If he's dependent on me, is that a God worth worshiping? Here's the beautiful thing that's even far more great than being needed, being wanted. Some of us have found our value so much in the idea of God needing us, that you've missed something far more powerful than him needing you. It's him wanting you. Let me illustrate this way. I I have a a son, Arlo, and uh, God needs me just like I need Arlo's help taking out the trash. (laughs) This is an activity me and my son do. Hey, buddy, you want to help daddy take out the trash? Absolutely. (laughs) Now, it is far more difficult for me to take out the trash with the four-year-old hanging on to the bottom of a trash bag. It takes way longer for me to do something that I could do quicker by myself, that I could do easier by myself, that we wouldn't have to struggle by myself, that mess wouldn't get spilt everywhere if I did it by myself. But because I love him so much, because I just want to spend time with him, I say, baby, come here and help daddy with this. Let me translate it. Why don't I have imperfect people give me a perfect praise? Why don't I have broken people try to represent the gospel of Jesus? God doesn't need you, baby, but let me tell you the good news. He wants you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to hear what you're going through. He wants to know the deep secrets in your heart. And when you realize that, it'll set you free. No, 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 he don't need me because if you think he needs me, you start doing stuff and treating yourself like something you ain't. Well, you know, if I don't do it, I don't know. You know, if I don't, if I don't pray for that person, I don't know what's going to happen to him. You should pray. But if you dropped dead right now, God's miracles would not stop moving. All these things that we get our spiritual uh, proudness from, you know they ain't for God, they're for you. This is why it's so important to understand the importance of worship. The whole service, there's only one part that's for God. Worship. We pray. That ain't moving nothing but your stuff. God's the same. When I preach, it ain't changing God. It's to encourage you. There's only one part of this where we say, God, this is the only part that we can give you, and that is the worship to God. And Paul comes to the people in Rome, and I'm coming today, to say, let's let's make sure we got our priorities straight. Let's make sure we realize where we fall in this pecking order. Let's make sure we understand the importance of how God set things right. And he's coming to them in the the beautiful context of, of the book of Romans is he's not writing to like a bougie church. 
You know what I'm saying? This ain't a church in Beverly Hills or in Agora Hill. This ain't, this ain't that. This is a church that literally the emperor is ripping families apart to try and stop the message of the gospel. This is a church that is continually persecuted. I know people be in your comments, but these people's life was on the line. It cost something a little different at the time. It, raising your hand for Jesus wasn't just a cool thing to do. No, it cost you something. You, your family might be split apart. You might be. They were literally taking Christians. And you know, y'all, y'all know in the movies where we, uh, we go and they go to the Coliseum and it's like, oh, the gladiators. Originally, there were Christians that they were sacrificing to be killed and eaten by lions. So saying I'm a follower of Jesus felt a little different. It wasn't a casual thing you post about from your YouVersion Bible plan. It cost you something. Saying you're a follower of Jesus, it meant something. And he's coming to encourage them. And I love this about Paul because he's saying, you know what? They're persecuting you. They're trying to split apart your families. Your life is on the line. But I want to clarify two things that are more powerful and that have the potential to change your life. Is these two words. A belief and a confession. Now, I, I, know, I know when we talk about confession and, and saying the right things and the power of your words. Again, I grew up in church. I get it. You know all the right scriptures. Power of life and death is in your tongue. You know, your grandma will smack you on the mouth. You say something crazy. I get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> what, what Paul is trying to articulate is that the very way that you are ripped from the pit of hell and put into eternity is by a belief in your heart and a confession with your mouth. The way the greatest miracle of all time, someone's soul being saved happens, is one belief and one confession. I know there are so many things we love to celebrate, but Paul takes all of that and brings it down and says, there's one thing you need to know. They can split apart your family. They can persecute persecute you. They can take things from you, but there's one thing they can't take, a belief in your heart and a confession with your mouth. They can say whatever they want to say. They can put whatever laws they want to put up, but there's one thing they can't touch, a belief in your heart and a confession with your mouth. This idea of confession hits me so personally because when we had kids, uh, we, we came up with some confessions. And we do these every single day. There are Metcalf, Metcalf confessions. I, before I walked up on this stage, I said them in my head and in my heart. I say these every single thing. My four-year-old is usually one to scream and say, Dad, you forgot the confessions. It's like, okay, son, chill before I smack you, before we do these confessions in the name of Jesus. We say this every single day. We say Metcalf's carry, peace and purpose, kindness and compassion. Boldness and bravery and love and light. Every single day. Metcalf's carry. Peace and purpose, kindness and compassion, boldness and bravery and love and light. Peace and purpose, kindness and compassion, boldness and bravery and love and light. Why did I give my kids some clarifying declarations? Because there are some things about your identity that you discover. And then there are other things that as a father, I want to decide for you. I'm not going to leave you out here to try to discover who you are. I'm not going to leave you out here trying to discover to find out what's on the inside of you. But as your father, I'm going to tell you who you are. You carry peace and purpose. What does that mean? You're not subject to anxiety in a room, but the room's subject to the peace that you carry. You don't have to walk into a situation talking about, ah, this feels weird. You walk in and say, I command the peace of God in this room. And because I'm here, anxiety has to go because I carry the spirit of the living God on the inside of me. I carry kindness and compassion. In a world trying to cancel people and talk about people, the scripture's clear. It's his kindness that draws us to repentance. It's not our scriptures. It's not our comments. It's not our judgments of people that lets them see the love of Jesus. It's the kindness and compassion. For he looked on the crowd and saw they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he felt kindness for them. That's one thing I hate to say it, the church has lost. You forgot the power of being kind to people. Where's your smile at? No wonder nobody want to come to church. No wonder nobody want your testimony. You're looking sideways. You look mad. Why in the world? I just don't understand why they won't come to church. I just don't understand. Maybe because you look mad when you invited them. You ain't got no joy. You're so spiritual. You ain't laughed in I don't know how long. 
Well, I just don't think that a woman of God or the man of God. Okay. But the scripture says this, the joy of the Lord is our strength. No wonder you ain't got no strength. No wonder stuff taking you out. No wonder you're still subject to that temptation from 13 years old. You lost your joy. <laughs> Carry boldness and bravery and love and light. And today, I came to give you one belief and one confession. One belief and one confession. Now, I want to precursor these words with these are some of the most dangerous three words you could ever believe. These are some of the most dangerous three words that you could ever actually trust in your spirit. These three words will require something of you. They're going to ruffle your dysfunction. They're going to deal with your damage. They're going to light a fire on the inside of you that might burn some stuff up you like. It may have you making decisions that your friend group don't understand. I just want to precursor you because that's another thing. I grew up in church and we like to bait and switch people. Come to Jesus. It's all easy. He'll heal your problems and nothing will go wrong. Okay. And the book of Job. So... Just explain that to me, theologian. So, I came to Jesus and my life's been perfect. Wow, okay. So, you're the one person in the world who has that experience. I don't know. These words are going to cost you something. But the gift is far greater than the cost. The title of my sermon today, the belief and the confession that I want to impart in your spirit, is these three words. God chose me. God chose me. This is dangerous because the church has been suffering from a deep insecurity. Church people are some of the most fearful, worrisome, unsettled people I know. You want to know how much I know? Because of how loud your prayers are. Oh, goodness. I'm not trying to offend nobody, I promise. I'm just, I grew, I've been around this for a little bit. And sometimes the way you deal with your fear is you shout louder. Instead of saying, I'm afraid. You don't say, I'm afraid. You say, in the name of Jesus, I command. And what you really need to say is, I am, I'm, I don't know how this is going to go. A more genuine prayer would be, God, I am so afraid. That I don't, and I don't have any tools to communicate that. But what I really just want to say is if you could please do whatever you want to do. God chose me. These three words have changed something in my spirit and something in my soul. These three words will have you walking into any situation confident on the God on the inside of you. These three words work in any situation. These three words have the power to change your life. Somebody say, God chose me. God chose me. I don't know why he chose me, but he did. God chose me. I'm not perfect, no, but God chose me. I love you, but you didn't choose me. God chose me. I, I appreciate your applause, but you didn't put me up here. God chose me. I love you a lot, but you didn't bring my marriage together. God chose me. I, the, I'm telling you, if you would get this in your spirit, it would be the antidote to every lie the enemy has sent your way. How are you ever going to do that? I don't know, but God chose me. How's your marriage? marriage going to make it. I don't know, but God chose me. I came to impart faith in this room where you've lost the confidence to trust God, where you've lost the ability to stand up confident. I am here to ignite something that you would trust. You didn't choose God, but God chose me. God chose me. God came and found me. God's the one who worked the miracle in my life, and nobody else is going to get the credit. If you could believe that God chose you, because here's the thing, some of you, I can already sense it. The idea of walking in that much confidence, the world has sold you, is cocky. Some of us are so riddled by fear and insecurity and comparison to walk in a room and say, God put me here. 
well, I don't know. You know, technically, you know, you got the job, and then it was actually, you know, so-and-so. They got you the connection. Oh, so now they getting the glory from your life. I don't know about you, but I've just made a decision. Nobody else, including me, is getting the glory from my life. God put me here. God saw me in my pain. God is the one who pulled me out. God is the one who made a way when there seemed to be no way. Is there anybody in here that God has made a way in your life, that he's worked some things out? I don't know if you forgot or not, but go back a couple years and think about where you were. God put me here. God made a way when there seemed to be no way. God healed my body. God has kept my family. God kept my marriage. Let me get personal for me. As a pastor in 2020, I was suicidal, curled up under my desk, ready to take my own life. And guess what? It wasn't the title of pastor that saved me. It wasn't my sermons on YouTube that came and found me under my desk. It wasn't a journal entry that came and rescued me. God chose me, God met me in my office. God spoke vision into my heart. God said, you've got two more children to have. God said, you have not seen the best days of your life. It was God who found me. And I came to remind somebody in here who's lost your testimony, and therefore you've lost your hope, and you've lost your joy, and you're walking around thinking, I don't know how this is going to work out, and I don't know what the future holds. It doesn't matter what the future holds because you know the one who holds the future. God chose you. God put you in this time. Ain't nobody else worked this out. God put you here. Ain't nobody else decide how this is going to go. So the sovereign hand of God is what brought us here. God put me here. There is something on the inside of you that will shut up the lies of the enemy. Nobody else in your family has ever done that. It don't matter. God chose me. But what about all the money and what are you going to do about this? It don't matter. God chose me. God chose me. There are four things that happen if you believe this. They are very dangerous and they can change your life. If you believe... The phrase, God chose me, the first thing it does is it keeps you ready. For all my note takers, for all my scholars out here, write this first one down. If you believe God chose me, it keeps you ready. If I was to walk up to you and say, hey, um, you know, we're, we're putting together a basketball team, and uh, I'm going to come back in 10 months and if you're ready, if you've been practicing, if you've been preparing, I'm going to sign you on a contract on our basketball team we're starting. Some of y'all would be like, okay, <laughs> cool. If LeBron James came up to you and said, hey, I'm putting together a basketball team. And I'm going to come back in 10 months. And I'm going to sign you to a contract if you're ready. Depending on who picks you, changes your preparation. The integrity of the individual who selects you out has you acting different. Some of y'all walk around, I don't know if you heard or not, but Braun came to the crib the other day. I don't know. Because the person who chose you pulled something out of you. Some of y'all ain't never touched a basketball in your life. But the day that day happened, you say, boy, let me get out of here. Hold on. Like, why, you would change some stuff about your, your eating habits would have to change. Your, your sleep habits would have to change. Your community, there are some people, let me be clear, some scrubs that you've kept in your friend circle that you would say, somebody put something on me, so I got to prepare for it. Can I tell you, it wasn't a basketball player who chose you. It was the creator of the universe who said, I have a plan and a purpose for you. I saw you before you were in your mother's womb. It's time to get ready. It's time to get ready. I know you don't see what the plan is now, but I came to tell you it's time to get ready. Some of you, God's told you you're going to write books, and you have been so stuck in comparison and fear and in the fact that you didn't do well in English class, and it's kept you from doing the thing God placed in you. God chose you, so get ready. Some of you, God told you. He told you, I'm about to bring this person into your life, the spouse you've been praying for, I'm about to bring them. And you still out here talking to these scrubs in your DMs. 
<laughs> and listen, don't be, don't be getting it. Like, we all got stuff. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the stuff you know you're supposed to get rid of. The stuff you know you're supposed to be doing different. And you somehow forgot God chose you. So I have to prepare differently. And here's what happens when you realize you got to get ready. Um, here's what I want to say. Uh, you don't owe an explanation of your calling to the people around you. I love them, but you may not understand everything he's asked me to do in this season. Why you ain't going out no more? You think you better than everybody else? No, I'm sorry. God chose me. I just got to get ready. There's some things I'm preparing for. There's some things I'm believing for that acting how I used to act ain't going to get me. So I got to change some stuff in my life. It's time to get ready. I got something I'm preparing for. I got some, a calling set out in front of me. I got children to raise, so I can't go to your house and play 2K. I'm so sorry. I've got stuff to do. I've got a mission and a mantle to carry. There is something going on in my life that I cannot explain to everybody that I'm not here to prove to anybody in this room because he spoke it to me 10 years ago and told me what it was going to be. So I'm standing here knowing God chose me. You believe God chose you, it keeps you ready. Amen. Number two, write this down, it keeps you ridiculous. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, my walk kind of changed on this one. This is the one that I feel, because here's the thing, uh, most of our faith and our confessions keep us reasonable. Some of us walking around with God dreams that are honestly real reasonable. You know, one of the most offensive things that could happen to me personally is if I was to be so honest with what I feel like God's asked me to do, and I explained it to you, and you said, that sounds reasonable. You know what reasonable means? That sounds within reason. That sounds like it doesn't go against anything in the natural order that everything has been set up, that sounds like, let me use this language just to make it click for some of y'all who stand at me, that sounds like it wouldn't take a miracle. It sounds reasonable. God did not die on a cross and go into the pit of hell and beat the brakes off the devil and come back with the keys of the kingdom for you to live a reasonable life. He didn't call, come back for you to say, yeah, I'm just trying to raise some decent kids who might have some confidence. Get out of here. I'm raising world changers who are going to step into industries and shift the atmosphere. I'm raising children who are going to know their worth. And when people try to suggest to them who they are, they'll say, no, I know who I am because I carry peace and purpose. So get behind me, Satan. God did not save you to live a reasonable life. You know what drew people to the church and to Jesus in the early days? You know what was the testimony of the disciples? It was crazy, ridiculous, unexplainable, unreasonable miracles. Where are the miracles at? I know you're believing for $20 so you can just make sure you get by. Do you think God died so we could get by? Do you think God died on a cross so you could just barely live in purity? So you could just barely have a good marriage? So your business might make a difference? I'm speaking this passionately because I see so many believers glazed over with religion. Coasting through life, making no impact on the world around them. You can live that way if you want to. But as for me and my house, the Metcalf household, we're here to shake things up. We're here to make a difference in the earth. When we die, they're not even going to say the name Metcalf. They're going to say, when they walked in the room, I don't know, I just felt something different. When they did so, the way they serve people and the way they love people and the way they raise their kids... It keeps you believing for stuff that don't make sense. And if you're always looking for what God's doing in your life to make sense to you, there is a category of God you will always miss out on. I get it. There's a level of stuff that you can pray for and it makes sense. You know, I'm really not feeling good right now. I got to go do this presentation at work tomorrow. So God, could you just help me feel better? 
and you take some Advil, and you take a little vitamin C, and you get some good sleep. You wake up feeling better. That makes sense. But sitting there on your deathbed, saying, I know what the doctor said, but I serve the great physician. Let me go to the other side. Because that's stuff that's easy to shout about. I know what the doctor said. And I know the diagnosis. And you know what? Re this will mess with some of your theology. You know what the best prayer you can pray in some of those moments? God, I know you can. But whatever your will is. And here's what I'm praying for. Give me the faith to trust you either way. See, this is some mature prayers. This is stuff that ain't easy to shout about. This is stuff that don't, the B3 don't come up for. But the truth is, the faith to trust God when they die, the faith to trust God when the diagnosis comes in, that's some real faith. That's some gangster faith. That's some deep level stuff that you can't get from an Instagram clip. That's some stuff that you spent before God, praying before him and saying, God, I need you. That's some stuff you can't get going to church twice a month. That's some stuff you can't get. A real faith that says, God, I trust you if it goes the way I want and God, I trust you if it all falls. God, I trust you if everything works out my way. And God, I trust you if they all leave me. God, I trust you if you're good. I trust you in the bad. God, I trust you, yet they slay me. So will I trust him. No matter who comes. No matter. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Your rod and staff, they comfort and guide me. It's time for believers to mature. It's time to stand up like three Hebrew boys in the fire and say, our God can, but even if he don't, I'm still not bowing to culture. I'm still not bowing to people. I'm still not trying to please nobody. I'm going to live because God chose me. God chose me. God put me here. God called me out. I'm not pretending to be nobody. I am somebody because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives on the inside of me. God put me here. God put me here. You didn't put me here. I love you so much, but you didn't put me here. I'm glad you're here, but you didn't put me here. I love you and I appreciate the encouragement but that's not what has me standing up every morning. If you believe God chose you, it keeps you ready. It keeps you ridiculous. This third one is so important, you can take a seat. It keeps you reverent. You know, me and Abby first got married, you know, we would get into an argument, and we would be arguing, going back and forth, and we'd get to a point where it'd be time, you know, for the worst part, is where you say you're sorry. You know, some of y'all don't know. Some of y'all ain't said sorry in a long time. You're like, do people still do that? Uh, <laughs> people who love their spouse do. I don't know. <laughs> um, but we get there, and, I, you know, we get through. I mean, I'd be like, sorry. Sorry. Okay, sorry, fine. I'd be like, I just, that, that doesn't, we're not okay. What do you mean we're not okay? I said sorry. Well, you just, you didn't mean it. How you know what I meant? You don't know what I, you know my heart? You know what's in my heart? What's in my heart right now? <laughs> and what she would say these words, um, Charles, it's not what you say. Some of y'all wife said that to you too, huh, brother? You, <laughs> he said, it's how you say it, man. I done hear that for 35 years. I <laughs> On this one specifically, the emphasis is on how you say it. On ready and ridiculous, there's a baritone, a bass, and a confidence when you say God chose me. But on this third one, I don't know God chose me. I've been through a lot. Yet I have no reason for him to have chosen me. The song said it, you've had so many reasons to leave. I'm reverent. And there's something 
that I'll address in my generation that we've lost, and it's the fear of God. He is the God of grace, and he is the God that when my man's reached out and tried to help carry the ark, he dropped dead because God said, don't touch it. Why would he do that? I don't understand. He said, don't touch it. It don't matter. He don't owe all the explanation. He said, don't do it. Well, I just don't understand. I don't understand why God would look. It don't matter if you understand because you're a human. And if you could understand, that means you'd have the mind exactly like God, which means God would think like you. And if God thought like you, that means he'd be really similar to you. And the Bible's very clear. His ways are not your ways and his thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways. So I'm reverent. I understand that if I didn't show up today, the Spirit of God was not waiting on me to do nothing. I understand that my gifting did not come from me. So it would be the most ridiculous thing ever to get proud in a gift you didn't get yourself. Let me talk to all my church creatives out here that be looking like a, a fool sometimes. If I was to walk up to you and give you a fresh pair of J's, and then somehow you walk around talking about, look at my J's, look what I did. You see how fresh I am? Dummy, you're broke. You didn't have no money to get your... The, how are you going to be proud in a gift somebody else gave you? I don't know if you've heard me sing or not. You think... Okay, let me not, let me not say what I'm trying to say here. God gave you that gift. God gave you that business. God gave you that talent. God gave you that singing ability. You don't believe he can take it away? It happened all that. Saul, you know Saul reigned years after God had left him, right? See, y'all know the stories, but you don't know the verses. That's the issue right there. It says the hand, that day, God was with Saul no more. It was 20, 30 year, more years he had the position. But God's hand was not on him. Just because you got a podcast don't mean God's hands on your life. Just because you got a microphone don't mean God's hands on your life. There's a reverence. God chose me. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know. I'm not perfect. There's a lot of people. He could have chosen, but I'm reverent. He keeps you ready, keeps you ridiculous, keeps you reverent. And this last one, he keeps you resilient. If we're honest in church, a lot of us are tired of getting back up. Though a righteous man falls, he gets back up. I don't know about you, but sometimes I be feeling like I don't necessarily want to get back up. God, you're good, and I love you, but I don't necessarily want to have to forgive them. I don't necessarily want to do what you've asked me to do. I don't want to have to go to Thanksgiving and act like I am actually cool with all the people there. Oh, y'all want to be fake today. Like, there ain't six people. You're going to walk up and be like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> hey, yeah, good to see you. Okay. Can you make sure I don't sit by her, please? Because if I sit by her, I'll be, she say one thing. <laughs> one thing. Guys laughing. They just don't, guys just don't have the emotional maturity to not say, you just be standing around watching a game like, yeah, you're doing good. Yeah, and on the inside, you're like, oh, God, I hate them. They never saw my games. <laughs> it keeps you resilient. It has you say, you know what, I don't want to stand up. I don't want to forgive. I don't want to keep going. I, really, I don't want to have to be strong. Some of you, 
The compliments you've gotten have gotten frustrating at this point. You're so strong. The truth is, you've had to be strong. You didn't necessarily want to be strong. Man, you just keep going. Even this, and I mean this in the most loving way, some of us, we've had this fight in us that you think has gotten you here. But the truth is, what that fight has cost you has changed you from the person you really are. You've been in protection mode for so long. You've been in fighting mode for so long. You didn't know where your meal, next meal was coming from for so long. You didn't feel safe for so long. It changed who you were. It changed how you talked. It changed how you looked at people. It changed the grace you used to carry in your heart. It changed how you used to, how you used to view people and how you used to give, how generous you used to be. Wow. Wow. How much fun you used to have as a kid. How much space and grace you would make for other people. Some of us have forgotten that the same people that we talk about in our small groups, somebody years ago was in a group and someone brought your name up. And they say, hold on, don't, don't, don't talk about them. God's still got a plan for their life. No, 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 we don't, we don't talk about people. We're, we're, we don't accuse people. We're advocates for people. How did the church become the accuser? You see what she wearing? You see what they posted? You see what he preaching? Oh, my gosh. What are, what are they? Is he from that one church where that one thing happened? I don't know. We ain't scared up here. God chose me, baby. I ain't what you. And all of that has kept you. Here's, here's the thing. I'll close with this. The scripture is very clear. The commandment that Jesus gives Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor. I know you know the scripture. Do you actually feel that though? Love your neighbor as yourself. It's hard to give grace to other people. You ain't got no grace for you. The grace you give other people says far more about you than it does them. The way you judge people says far more about you than it does them. And what would happen if we got the focus off of all those other things and say, you know what? God, God chose me. Out of any time you could have been born. I know maybe you didn't have perfect parents. But of everything that could have happened to you through your middle school and high school time, the people you grew up around, the decisions you were on the verge of making and then someone just happened to call you, the time you were driving that one way and then you said, you know, I don't know why, I'm just going to take a left right here. I could, it'd be way quicker to go this way, but I'm going to take you didn't even know on the news that night yeah. someone's life was taken. The amount of times you were sitting in a dark, hurting, and broken place and somehow there was a courage deep on the inside of you to get up the next day. Amen. How'd that happen? God chose me. Today, my greatest hope and prayer is that you would leave here not expecting your life to be perfect. Not expecting all your pain to go away. I wish I could promise that to you. I really wish I could. But God did not promise us a perfect life. He didn't promise us that everything was going to work out our way all the time. 
There's some stuff, I mentioned it earlier, but it'll mess you up if you actually read the book of Job. I know you like know the story and idea. Job chapter one will bust up your theology in two seconds. Literally set the scene. It's like the heavenly court is talking and the devil walks in. It's like, hold up, pause. <laughs> Who is the heavenly court? And the devil still can just rock up to heaven like that? Like, what? We, anybody going to blow past that? You ain't even thought about it. Some of you are like, oh, my God, he, he just rolled up into heaven? <laughs> he walks up. He comes to God. He's like, you know, I see this man, Job, and he's just praising you because he's got a lot of stuff. But if I took his stuff away, he wouldn't praise you. And this is where the theology that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people there's a twist. Because God says these words. Have you considered my servant Job? And I was talking to a friend one time, and her mother had just passed away. And she said these words, and it jacked me up. She said, What an honor. To be considered. You know, I know you would have never wanted to be considered. But what an honor. For your name to be the one in God's mouth. I'm looking, you know, I know there's, there's a, a, a broken and a hurting world out there and, 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 and the enemy's talking and trying to say stuff. And God says, have you considered my servant? Enemy trying to come against marriages and come against families. And he, God brings up your name. Devil trying to send accusation against people saying, you know, nobody's living for you anymore, and look at this, and look how Christians are talking about each other, and look how they're judging each other, and then God utters your name. When you believe God chose you, it keeps you ready. It keeps you ridiculous. It keeps you resilient. And it keeps you reverent. Today, I'm going to ask everybody to stand in this room. We're going to close. I don't know where you are today or what you may need or what you may be feeling or what may be in your heart, but maybe you're in here and you need one of those four things. There's an area of your life where you need to get ready. You've been putting off the preparation. You've been putting off the ideas. You've been putting off what you know God told you, and you need to get ready. There are some of you that you need to start living ridiculous. You realize your life is a little too safe. It's a little too planned out. It's a little too organized because if it's so organized, some of us have planned God out of our plans. And we would call an, a miraculous interruption from him the devil. Not every change in your life is the devil. Not every person leaving your life is the devil. Not every bad news report that is an opportunity for you to trust God and for God to get glory out of your life is the devil. Maybe you need to start living ridiculous. Maybe some of you, you've lost your reverence. And some of you, you need the faith to be resilient. If you're in this room, I want everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to pray over two groups of people. The first group is people that need one of those four things. You need to get ready. You need to live ridiculous. You need, there's a reverence there's a resilience in you that you may seem to have lost and you say, you know what, that's me, I need that. There's something in me, I don't know what, but I resonated with you say that. Or I just simply, I need help and courage believing that God chose me. Yeah. If that's you in this room, nobody looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed. You say, I need one of those four things. Would you just lift your hands right now all over this room? You need to get ready. You need, you need something in your spirit. You need to believe God chose you. You need your faith need to be encouraged. You already got a relationship with Jesus, but this, there's a something in this message that you needed. Holy Spirit, you see our hands. God, and there's something in us, Lord Jesus, that realizes we are not enough. 
It's not us who saved us, Lord God. It's not us who brought us out of our dark situation, but we're raising our hands saying, God, we need you. So right now, Holy Spirit, I am praying that you would impart faith like never before, Lord Jesus. I am speaking right now, Lord God, I thank you that the wind of the Holy Spirit right now would just flow through this room. Hearts, Lord God, that have been broken, I thank you, you would begin to mend them right now, Lord God. Heads that have been down, Lord Jesus, would you be able to lift the head of the broken, Lord God? God. Spirits, Lord God, that have been run over time and time again. Holy Spirit, right now, by your miraculous power, with the same power that you raised Christ from the dead, I thank you, you would raise dreams from the dead, confidence from the dead, vision from the dead, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you chose us. You can put your hands down, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in this room and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is an opportunity. Maybe you're in this room, you've never accepted Jesus, or maybe you need to re rededicate your life to him. The scripture is clear. It's what we've talked about. You believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You shall be saved. And it's funny you preach a message like God chose me, and people still don't realize he chose you, but there's still a choice you have. My son didn't pick his DNA, but he does pick if he identifies who his father is. So it don't matter if you acknowledge it, he's still your father. But there's an inheritance that comes when you submit yourself to the father. There's peace that comes. There's joy that comes. If you're in this room, if you've never accepted Jesus, you've never accepted the gospel, the good news, the good news is, is that there is a God who covered all of your brokenness, who covers all of your pain. It doesn't mean everything goes away, but it means you have the strength to get through it. If you're in this room and you've never accepted Jesus or you're watching online and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you want to do that today, I'm going to count to three and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand boldly. Not shy, not wondering who's looking around you. This is a moment that changes your life forever. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, here and online on the count of three, I want you to lift your hand. One, two, three. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask everybody in this room, if you can grab a seat. We're going to close out. Grab a seat real quick. Lord, I'm going to ask everybody in this room to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Dear God, thank you for dying on a cross for me. I admit I've made mistakes. Save me. Change me. Transform me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Can we celebrate people who just gave their life to Christ? Hey, listen, thank y'all so much for having me. I appreciate you. Love you so much. Amen. Can we celebrate what the Lord just did for us through Pastor Charles Metcalf? And listen, as a tradition of our church, if you were one of those that he called, you can come down because we have something for you. So if you gave your life to Christ, if it was your first time and you are choosing God, come down. If you're rededicating or you're calling Relentless your home today, you can come down so that we can take you, get some information from you and some to you. You can come down. If you raised your hand, if you were in one of those three categories, you can come down. Now, can we celebrate our elders' hands are reached out. They'll meet you if you're coming. If you're coming, if you're coming and you raised your hand. If not, yes, let's celebrate like heaven celebrates so that we can, yes, bless the Lord. So grateful to have you, sweetheart. And you, and you, and you. If you, will, if you will continue to celebrate the way heaven celebrates, they will feel like it's okay to come. And we thank God for what he's doing. God bless you. Welcome. Hallelujah. God bless you. If you are in need of that acceptance today, if you're ready, if you're ready to be ridiculous, and you're also humble enough to be reverent and also resilient because just like a rubber band, God is the one that's the great expander. And so when we contract, he has the ability to expand us. And I need us to run, 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 run ahead with understanding that God chose us. Hallelujah for the young man of God coming. Hallelujah with Elder Brandon. Is there anybody else that wants to make their confession known? 
Hallelujah. We've said the prayer. We've got more. She's coming. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the Lord. We want to give you a moment. We want to give you your time so that you can come. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, listen, we celebrate all of the ones who have chosen to connect to this word that's straight from heaven through the mouth of Pastor Charles Metcalf today and online. We are so grateful for you joining, not Relentless Church, but joining the kingdom of God. Because we say, even if we're not the church for you, let you please get in a Bible-based church and get connected and stay connected because we're all on the same team in concert if we're doing it right. There's no competition in the kingdom. It's about being connected to God, not a church. Of course, we would love for you to be a part of this family. But if you want to just be a part of the family of Christ, that is what we're celebrating today. That's why we do this every week. That is the heart of Christ. So we are grateful to God for your choosing today, and we love you so much. Thank you for saying the prayer, and thank you for coming into the house of the Lord. The kingdom is celebrating. So let's go up and worship one more time for these wonderful, wonderful vessels that have chosen today. And if you'll please walk this way. You're going to follow Jordan, and she's going to get some information from you, some to you, so that we can stay connected. We love you so much. One more time for Pastors Charles and Abby Metcalf. Thank you for that word, sir. We love you. God chose me. Hey, you can walk boldly in confidence today, knowing that there's no arrogance in that. Yep, God chose me. What are you doing? God chose me. Don't have to explain it to you. <laughs> Y'all know that's me anyway. Yes, I love it. Thank you so much. Listen, God is amazing. Have a beautiful, beautiful rest of your Sunday. Happy Thanksgiving, because when we see you again, we will have already celebrated Thanksgiving. And next week, I'm excited. Are you excited about next week? So listen, y'all, God's doing something amazing. This season is crazy. And um, I have the mind to say I have some crazy faith. But there is an individual who's radically shaken the kingdom with crazy faith. So next Sunday, Pastor Michael Todd from Transformation Church will be here to rock out with us. Uh-huh, it's a season. It's a season of rest for our pastor, but he didn't leave us uncovered. I need you to get in the building so that we can shake this crazy faith up and we can go up and worship with Pastor Mike Todd next week. Bring your friends, bring your family. You will have had an amazing Thanksgiving. You won't have to pray the turkey away. And we're also expecting God to do amazing miracles. So tell your friends, tell your family, we're going to come together. We're a family. We're going to do it for Jesus. And let's get excited about what God has for us next week and beyond. Love you so much, Relentless. Have an amazing rest of your weekend. God bless you.